I want to begin by saying I really appreciate that um, the senior pastor of this church, uh, Pastor Famine, and the upcoming, uh, the next pastor in line, Jimmy, and all the leadership of the church, allowed me to be able to come and share with you this morning from the Word of God that will never pass away unfulfilled. Um, I also want to appreciate that uh, you could come and hear what God has to say. Of course, it's not new. It is what he has been saying in his word. But he simply anoints us differently to emphasize and to carry out and to reveal what he means on his, in his word and to kind of give us an understanding, not just knowledge, but understanding on getting to understand the mind of God in what he is saying in the scriptures. Uh, I came with my wife, Reverend Jemina Bai. I would wish you stand up. Uh, I'm look, when you look at me seeing, looking back, back there, I'm looking at the clock that keeps running up there that scares me. So I've just located it on top there. So that's my wife, Reverend Jemina Bai. We, that's my wife. Thank you for preaching <clears> up. <throat> Uh, we've been married for 28 plus years, and we have two sons. One of them, after finishing college here in the United States, is now an, an ordained minister. And um, he ministers in Indiana. We were able to preach uh, in the area when I was doing meetings in Indiana last week. But one, after finishing my conference in Phoenix, and meetings in Pennsylvania, I came over here and then we went to their church and the pastor for the first time uh, invited me to minister to the congregation and uh, it's a bigger church than this and uh, they gave me 30 minutes, yeah, like today, which is good. Uh, and then when I started preaching, Okay, the pastor kind of got excited and he introduced me and talked about our son, Steve. They're proud of him, really great. And um, uh, by the time I got the microphone, it was 18 minutes remaining on a clock that was bigger than that one. The numbers were bigger than that one, a digital clock. <clears throat> and uh, so I started preaching and I, God started doing what he does best. And as I was preaching, the word of God became came alive and the Spirit of God started doing what he does best. To cut a long story short I looked at the clock and I was almost eight minutes beyond time <clears throat> and I said my time is up and I gave the microphone to the senior pastor and he stood up and he couldn't do nothing. He said I don't know how to finish this meeting uh, whoever wants to go home let him go and um, and those who want to remain can remain and he asked people to wait to remain for prayer and I ended up praying after that moment for people the lines were going all the way up up to the kitchen where you're out there and I prayed for one hour and 22 minutes for people after that service I was long it's not going to be like that today I'll be a good boy I will I'll be a good boy we appreciate that the Lord gives us opportunities to travel uh, literally the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, I don't know how to say things before I preach in the last 25 years that Pastor Phil has known me not only in this area anywhere I go in the United States or anywhere I go in the world I don't know how to share other things when I'm invited to share the word of God so I straight go to the word of God can we do that now Luke chapter 8 Luke chapter number eight thank you for allowing Reverend Peter Kamau to preach on your pulpit last time he was here he's one of my associate pastors we attend I have ten, I have eight pastors under me in our church it's a little bit big and um, <clears throat> he's one of them and he was able to preach here and I bless the name of the Lord for that are you in Luke chapter 8? <clears throat> Bible says in verses 4 of Luke chapter number 8. And a great 
multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city and they had come to him from every city he spoke a parable a sower went out to sow his seed And as he sold, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 11 to 15. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Lest they should believe and be saved. Verse number 13. But the ones on the rock are the ones who when they hear they receive the word with joy and these have no root or believe for a while and in the time of temptation fall away. Verse number 14 and my key text this morning. My key verse this morning is number 14. That's where the message will come from. It says, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares. With the cares of this world, the, deceit, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity that's where i want to see it in today but let me read verse 15 because i promised to do so but the ones who that fell on good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience as i've already indicated this parable of the sower is not new even to the children in Sunday school. It's a very common parable that everybody understands because we live in, some of us grew up in farms and others still have farms and we drive through farms and we live next to farms and we can understand when we get a parable like this one that is so close to home. And I want you to know with all humility as a pastor, as a pastor, my greatest challenge in ministry has not been the international ministry that I do across six continents. It is not the many years I did evangelistic crusades, which I still do, and I do 10 meetings and revival meetings and leadership conferences, leadership conferences that I do in different parts of the world. That's not my biggest challenge. I have been preaching in international, I mean, I've, I've been, this is my 30th year of doing international ministries. And I want you to understand that is not what has challenged me as a minister of the gospel. My greatest challenge, which has become my greatest and deepest mot mot motivation in my preaching, is the 22 and a half years that I've pastored a congregation as the senior pastor. That's where the tire meets with the road. That's where you get to understand ministry. That is where you get to understand what people go through and the impact it has in their lives. That's when you understand that we are the same. We are all the same. But we face very different challenges in life. And we respond differently to those challenges in life. We may be all in Walmart shopping for 
Four Seasons or J.C. Penny or Elder Beeman or it doesn't I know all of them you better know that I know all of them you know we may be when one more and a situation arises but people as much as they are eating in the food court together when something comes when something arises I want you to understand every person will respond differently I have come to understand as a minister as a senior pastor of a growing church or if I want to blow my trumpet, although it has some hair in it, the largest church that we have in our city, I want you to understand, I've realized people are different. And people, though they hear the same message, the response can be very different. Because we all respond. I believe Pastor, your senior pastor, Pastor Furman, even as he plans to, you know, to hand over the baton, he can tell you it has been a challenge for him to be a minister, to pastor and shepherd souls than to do what he does outside the church. It's not a game of chase. It's challenging because you, weed, you want everybody to get it. But unfortunately, not everybody gets it. You can't be a cop and put the lights on on somebody and pull them over and tell them, you. You know, I was so happy yesterday that I could go to Sugar Creek in the fair. Was it the fair or what do you call it? Whatever you called it. The Swiss Festival. The Swiss Festival. You know, we were seated on a place. We got a lot of candies. I still have some, you know. And one of the things is we sat very close to these guys who have lights on the top of their cars. You know, we had three. We had a state trooper and we had a, uh, uh, we had a state trooper there and a highway patrol car, the, the very scary ones and, 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 you know I know where they are because I am on the errands you know and, and then we had a local you know Sugar Creek police uh, trooper there and they were just down to us and I was so happy to see them greet people while well, they are dressed you know in their style you know the way they I hope there's no one listening to me here now but I'm not this I'm not talking negatively you know they were there you know the way they walk you know they were there you know <laughs> They were talking to people and they were greeting people in a normal way. And I got a close caption of them in the real world, not in the world of lights. Not when they pull you over. I've never been pulled, so don't worry. I pray they don't. I always pray God protect me from the cops when I'm going to the road. Now hear me and hear me well. Thank you very much. Now hear me and hear me well because the clock is ticking. Jesus comes and receives a multitude of people coming to hear him. And he opens his mouth and he says, he gives them a parable and he says, a sower went out to sow a seed. I want you to understand that the seed was good. The seed was the same. It was all in a bushel, all the same basket. There was no lower quality seed on this side of the basket and high quality, <coughs> high yield seeds on this side of the basket and some medium quality seeds in the other corner of the basket. All the seeds were high yielding quality seeds. They were intended to be planted in the field for a harvest. The goal was the harvest, a bumper harvest, or whatever it would be. A great yield was the expectation. And Jesus goes on and say, as the, fa as the farmer went on his business of planting seeds, they started falling in four categories in the same form but in four they separated themselves in different types of grounds and he says the first one fell on the high on the wayside and soon the birds had a feast and the squirrels had a feast because they were lying right on top and they were taken out 
He says, in the same form and from the same seed basket, others fell on rocky ground. And they sprout up quickly, but because they, had, they could not penetrate the rocky ground, they soon withered. When the sun became hot. And then he leaves two others. I wish I can preach about the thirtyfold, that those that put good ground. I wish I can preach on the good ground, but today I want to hang on verse 14. I want to stay there for the remaining minutes. Because well, that's where the problem is today. And every pastor will agree with me. Whether you are preaching in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, and I preached in all those places, or you're preaching in North or South or Central America, and I've preached in all those places, or whether you're preaching in Europe, and I've preached since 1993 in Europe. Every pastor will agree with me. The challenge is on the third level of seed. The seeds that fell among thorns. They fell among thorns. The ground was good. But the neighbors, the environment around was not was good too. But they had a few other things that were growing beside them that were not corn, that are not soybeans, that are not any other thing next to the corn that had grown, the good seed that had grown, where, where thorns and thistles. And the Bible said, the crop grew together. Can I just use corn for this matter? The corn grew together. And the thorns and the thistles grew together too. They were busy growing as the corn was growing. And shortly, when it came to the time of producing the crop, getting the years out, the Bible says the thorns and the and the and the briars had already choked them. I wish I can choke myself, but that's all the fire can go. Mm. They choked them such that when it was time for harvest, hear me, church, when it was time for harvest, although they had an opportunity to grow on good ground, they had no yield. There was no harvest. They had the opportunity. They survived the wayside. They survived the birds that took other seeds from the same bushel. They survived. They missed the rocky ground. They came to the good ground. And I want to believe the good ground is in the church. The good ground is the church. I want to believe the good ground is the church. They came. They moved God by his grace and mercy. Delivered them from the nightclubs. Delivered them from disco, you know, from, from discos and from, booze, from drinking and from prostitution. And from drugs and anything evil. God succeeded snatching them out of the wicked society and brought them into the church but in the church they did not check who their associations are and they were easily chalked if you had me preach this message last time or any other time I want you to know it's gonna come out different and you think it's a different message hear me well because now I'm beginning to preach when I have 10 minutes remaining. Jesus says, they were choked. And in the most important time of their season, the harvest time, there was nothing. You call them years? There was nothing. Having had an opportunity to grow on good ground, 
they were, they had no crop, they had no seed, they had no yield. Isn't that dangerous? And then Jesus opens his mouth and he says, this is the interpretation of the parable. I know you are wondering what is this chocolate guy going to do? He's moving up and down and pacing up and down. When is he going to bring the message? And now. Jesus says, this are they that fell among thistles. He says, these are people that got the opportunity to hear the word and to receive the word. But three things dealt them a blow and denied them. Three things denied them a chance to produce the intended results. And number one, the cares of this world. The cares of this world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. And number three, the pleasures of life. My remaining minutes, I will talk about those three killer diseases that deny people that are not in the world but have found a place in the body of Christ, kind of deny them a chance to lead fruitful Christian lives. Let me go quickly to number one, the cares of this world. Let me tell you, brethren, cares can deny you peace. Cares can deny you joy. Cares can kill and inconvenience your faith and your resolve to serve God. Cares, all you need, the cares of this world, all that you need today is to open your television sets for 30 minutes and you will feel helpless. Do you know why? Not because you're watching Hallmark Channel, especially when you're watching the presidential debates <laughs> and you are hearing Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton describe each other and their country and you are there seated like an American and you wonder are they talking about the America that I live in or are they describing another country is America dead is America going away is America still great is America not great you are seated there wondering oh my god what is going to happen and very soon you start wondering are my children going to inherit anything in this country are my children going to have anything in this country is the future going to have anything um, is it worth working is, um, do I, am I going to have money am I going to have am I going to be sleeping and this happens am I going to wake up one day and find this has happened the cares of this world disease diseases have multiplied and they are becoming complicated every day and every time you go to see a doctor you are worried, you are afraid, you don't know what is what he's going to say or what she's going to say, what the diagnosis is going to be. And, and there are so many things that have cropped our hearts and burdened our souls today. Then the cares of this world are becoming more complicated than they were in the 20s or the 50s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. The world is becoming more complicated and Christians are finding themselves in the melee and it's very easy for you to feel like you're inside a washing machine woo, 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 woo. and it's, it gives you relief a little bit mm. then woo, 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 woo. It's, it's, it's very easy for you to be filled with a lot of care a lot of parents are struggling with their children having made the wrong choices they are burdened with all the cares, fear, anxiety, and doubt. Are my children going to make it? Is life going to be good? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be this and that? Jesus said, cast all your cares upon me. For I care for you. Give me your cares, Jesus said. You don't have what it takes to man them. You don't have what it takes to handle them. They can sweep 
you down like a tsunami. Jesus said, you believe in me, I'm your savior, I am your redeemer. Instead of sitting there and multiplying your levels of fear and anxiety and your eye blood pressure going up and things working different and getting acid in your tummy because you are caring too much. He said, cast your cares upon me for I care for you. If you are here and you are burdened by the cares of this world, and real fears because of sickness or disease, or your children or your business that is not doing well, I invite you to do something that is very easy by faith. Cast your cares on Jesus. Cast your cares on you, Jesus, because he has the capacity to care for you. I'm doing this as a pastor. I'm preaching the way I would preach to our church in Thika, Kenya. My brother, my sister, you don't have what it takes to handle the kind of weight that you are dealing with. My mom, my sister, my brother, the kind of weights the world is putting on our shoulders, the economy is putting on our shoulders, the job market, the scientific world, climate change and everything is taking away a place and burdening us down and weighing us so heavily such that sometimes our worry takes over the place of faith in our hearts. Again, as I finish on that portion, I say, cast your cares on Jesus, for he cares for you. Look at your neighbor and tell them, please do, cast your cares upon Jesus. I know children, you don't have a lot of cares because you cast them on the parents. And they care for you. But there are some of us who don't have a dad to cast their cares too. Some of us who don't have a mom, some of us who don't have somebody to take it on, to take it for us. I introduce you to him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far above all that you can think or ask, according to the power that is at work within you, that is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen? Amen. Realize you can only raise your kids to a certain level. You can make decisions for them at a certain level, legally. They are allowed to make their own decisions and you can only do such much. You can only instruct them in the ways of God. And if your son or your daughter is wayward, I want you to know there is a place you can go beyond. And that child to Jesus. And over that son as you kneel down every day before the God of heaven. Say, Jesus, I don't know where my son is now. But you know where he is seated. You know where he is standing. You know what he is driving. You know which corner of this country or of the world he is in. God, I cast my son to you or my daughter for you can do a better job than me. Is anybody hearing me? Instead of your business taking you to the hospital because it's not doing well. Come on, my son, child of God, my fellow brother, my fellow sister. Instead of worrying until the helicopter has to be called because an ambulance cannot rush you to the hospital fast enough. Because you are so sick. Because the business is not going well. Take it to Jesus. Hallelujah. Take it to Jesus. You are a child of God. The difference between you and any other man in this world, the difference between you and any other woman in this world who doesn't know Jesus, is that you love Jesus and you know God. You know Jesus. Cast your cares upon him. Young lady, turning 25, 26, 29, 31, and nobody's knocking your door. Or they simply date you for a day and quit. And you're so worried. Oh my goodness, am I going to get married? Yes, you will. In our Father's kingdom, there are many husbands. If it were not so, he would have told us not to expect one. Cast your care and your fear to him that creates husbands for people. The one who gives husbands. The one who gives wives is your God. He walked into a dark, he walked into darkness when there was nothing in Genesis chapter 1. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. He can walk into your situation. 
it can, I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who God is talking to because I want to get out of here and I can't get out of here and it's 11 in big letters back there. Who is this God is talking to? Who is this that cannot sleep? Who is this who when they wake up to go to the bathroom, they cannot close their eyes again? Who are you? Who is this person who have to take four Tyrano PMs or three Tyrano PMs or Ali PM or Anvil PM to close their eyes and still after taking sleeping pills, you still cannot sleep because your heart is full of what? Talk to me, church. Cares. We worry over everything. The young worry that they will never get hold. And the hold are so worried that they can never get young again. They are called human beings. We are called human beings. Cast your cares on Jesus today. What is it? That takes away your sleep. As a child of God. When the Bible says. He giveth his beloved sleep. What is that thing. That has taken away your joy. What is that thing. That has taken away your joy. What is that thing. That has robbed you. Of your peace. While we sing. When peace like a river. Attended my soul. When all sorrows and billows roll, whatever the cause you have told me to say, it is what? It is well. It is well. What is this thing? The cares of this world. The cares of this world. That makes you a human being like me. That makes us human beings who need the power of God and the grace of God and the mercies of God. To conquer what you're experiencing. Because how do you hold on to the promise of God with one hand. While you are surrounded by all these threats. And all these things. That choke. Our faith. And our peace. Is anybody getting what I'm saying? Oh I'm just sweating here like a kangaroo with asthma for nothing. You know I, 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 I want you to understand. I want you to understand. The Spirit of God is putting a very heavy burden on me of a people that are so much filled with care. So much. People that are filled with worry and care and are afraid. This morning God is saying, cast your cares upon me. You worry too much and your worry cannot do nothing. Just like my worry cannot do nothing. It's like me being worried about my house in Africa right now. Oh, did anybody break in last night and steal my this and my that? It's 9.4 thousand miles away. It's four. It's nine. My home, my home is 9.4 thousand miles away. What will my worry do? I cannot walk there. I cannot fly there. I am stuck here preaching up beyond the time limit. I can do nothing. And then you find, me, you find me crying at this corner. Oh God. Oh what will I do? Why did I ever come to the United States? I should have been home because I don't know. Somebody may be breaking into my house right now. The best thing I can do is stay Jesus. As I minister to your people in the United States. Take care of my concerns in Africa. That's the much I can do. And that gives me peace. Can you do that? Over your situation. Can you. Young man can you stand on your feet. Please. Come with your bottle of water please. That one. Is this your care. Your worry. That causes fear. And anxiety. In your life today. Can you hand it over to. Can you become Jesus for a minute. Can you please. Try Oh 
God, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I, this situation, God, is too much for me. He tells you, give it to me. Come on, just keep on telling me, give it to me. Just give it to me. Yeah, just do that. Give it to me. Jesus continues to tell you, give it to me. Hand it over to me. Trust me. Sometimes you take it to him and you take it back. And you feel like, no, my uncle can handle it better. My cousin can do it better. My husband can handle it better. My wife. And you tell them, you call them, you text them, you email them, you WhatsApp them, you post it on public Facebook. And everybody says, oh, we sympathize with it. That's all they can do. But Jesus says what? Come on. Tell me. Give it to me. Hand it over to me. Hand it over to me. He says, I can deal with it. I can take care of it better than you can do. Give it to me. You're worried about finances, your mortgage, you're worried about your car payment, you're worried about your house, you know, whatever payment, you're worried about this, all that. Jesus says, again, give it to me. Can you, this morning? Can you? I thought I would get time to preach about the deceitfulness, the deceitfulness of riches and the pleasures of life. That will be another day. That day is not today because time is up. But this is what the Spirit of God is, in, is putting in my spirit right now. That there are people who are dealing with fear, worry, and cares. And today Jesus is, and they are real. I'm not trying to say they are not real. Your care is real. Your fear is real. Your concern is genuine. It's not fake. He's not talked to you for three days. She has not talked to you for a week. He left last week and he has not called. Those things are real. These things are real. I'm not trying to downplay the level of anxiety and fear and worry. But I'm just trying to say it doesn't help by keeping it to yourself. Hand it over to Jesus. Today. Can I have the worship team come up? And just we stand on our feet. I'll preach those other points when Jesus will give me time. Let's finish this thing. I'm not trying to say worrying makes you less a human being or less a brother or sister in the Lord. No. I have worries. Sometimes I find myself worried about this and that and that. Ministry, family, the church. But quickly I realized Jesus said, cast it, cast your cares. He even never said give them to me. My, my son, Jesus did not say give them to me. Do you know what he said? Can you handle this? I know you catch balls. You can catch, you, you play football, whatever you call it in America. Jesus did not say bring it to me, walking slowly and humbly, bowing before me in adoration, in humble adoration. He says, come on, if you are tired of it, cast it. He said, cast it. If you, are, if, you are so, if you are so deep in this, if you are so worried, you are so anxious, you are so whatever, and you don't have time to bring it, come on, do what? Cast it. Throw it to me. Give it to me. I can deal with it better than you. I can deal with it. And that's how we are going to end the service this morning. Give it. To Jesus, let's stand on our feet. Thank you, son. Say, give this to me. You don't have to spend one more night worrying about this, worrying about this, concerned about this, afraid of this. And afraid of that. Pharaoh in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, as I finish, 
and all these calamities befall Egypt, the land of Egypt, when he had enslaved the children of God. And there's this one thing I'm going to talk about, the frogs. Frogs were everywhere in the land of Egypt, in their kneading balls, under their pillows and on their pillows, in the living room, on their desk, everywhere there were frogs, including Pharaoh's state house or white house. There were frogs everywhere. And when they could not spray the frogs and kill them, because you cannot kill a frog that God has sent to you, he called Moses and he sent for Moses and said, bring Moses here. And when Moses came, he told him, plead with your God to take away these frogs. We don't need them anymore. They are making us go nuts and bolts. Then Moses, it's in your Bible and my Bible. Moses looked at him and told him, I have the honor of deciding when you want God to take away the frogs. And you know what the Pharaoh said? Decide when you want God to take over and remove the frogs. And instead of saying, now, you know what the Bible says? He said, tomorrow. <laughs> Another 24 hours of frogs. I will always, during break time in heaven, I will ask God what Pharaoh meant. Maybe Pharaoh wanted to do some research on the frogs, or he wanted to do something. He wanted to kind of take selfies with the frogs, or he wanted to really do a lot of things with the frogs. You wonder what he wanted to do with the frogs in that next 24 hours. He said tomorrow. Then Moses told him, okay, it shall be taken away tomorrow. Why spend another night? Why spend another one hour while it can be done now in Jesus' name? Give us a song as we do this. Just sing now slowly as I make this prayer. Let's just pray. Let's bow for a word of prayer right now.